children will go down right after they say, go tell them on the mountain. We'll send the children back down. All that will stay here will be Mary, Joseph, and the baby Jesus. Do we have any wives in this here at all? causing disturbance in the service itself. We pray that you'll calm them down. We ask you, Lord, just to bless this. Uh, we, we, it's sort of been all frazzled and mixed up. We pray that you transform it. And out of the chaoticness of it all, we pray that you bring something beautiful. In the morning time when you made the world, everything was chaos. And you brought beauty out of chaos. And we ask you to bring beauty out of chaos this afternoon when we have our Christmas program. We ask you to let your Holy Spirit be upon us and we pray help our children to be at their best. And we pray they might really act out the parts. They might really be angels when they're supposed to be angels. And they're shepherds when they're supposed to be shepherds. Serious shepherds who really saw Jesus. And angels who had a message from heaven and proclaimed to the world. And a Mary and Joseph that were excited about giving birth to a son that was given by God and born in a glorious kind of a way with a star over the manger. Now just bless us, right? We, may we really put on a Christmas program where Jesus is really present, where we're really angels are there and the spirits of angels be upon us, we pray. And we pray that we might really have a sense of expectancy and jubilation and really act it out the way it was meant to be acted out. Now bless us, our Father. Bless David as he sings tonight, anoint him. And bless Dale, help him with all the uh, struggles he's having with the songs. We just pray you will bless Dale and anoint him tonight. And we just pray that it will be an anointed service of God that will bless the people's hearts. Bless our children, we pray. They're precious. We love them. But we know we have to straighten them out that nobody else in all this world cares about our children like we do. We ask you to help us, give us wisdom with our children, and to help them guide them, straighten, correct them, discipline, whatever we have to do to bring them up, that they might stand for Jesus in the last day. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. When I think of how he came so far from glory Grace, I'm not going to take my place. 
And we welcome each one of you here today. And we pray the Lord will bless you today and speak to you today. In Jesus' name, in God's name, I speak and pray. Okay, we're going to have some uh, songs. We're going to say a couple verses of each song, just two verses. Joy to the world. We're going to let daily this.
which inspire your heavenly song. You turn with me to uh, number nine, 196 in the back of your hymnal. Unto us a child is born. I think it's in a blue. A blue book. 196. I'll read a sentence, I'll have you repeat the sentence right after me, if you will. For unto us a child is born. Repeat it right after me. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And, the, and his government shall be upon his shoulder. And his government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful, and his name shall be called Wonderful. Counselor, Counselor, the Mighty God, the, Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the, Everlasting Father the, Prince of Peace, the Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government, and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David, and upon his kingdom, to order, it, to order it, and to establish it, to establish it with judgment and with justice, with and with justice from, henceforth from henceforth even forever. With righteousness shall he judge the poor, and remove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth, with the rod of his mouth, with the breath of his lips, shall, shall he slay the wicked. Isaiah 9. And the Lord bless this word to our hearts. May we let Jesus be everything he is, and not try to reduce him to something that we control. We have Myrtle Barber very sick in me. St. Mary's Hospital, and we want to pray for her earnestly this morning. Shirley Horner, Chris Jensen is doing much better. Gordon James, my brother-in-law, has Bell Palsy. He's doing some better too. Any other urgent requests that we might have? Mommy. Here we have two. Carmel? For Frank Durkee. Frank. Turkey. Turkey. Okay. Fred? I can't hear. Who? His family. Fred's family. Daddy. Roy Scholes. Okay. Let's see. I have the unspoken request with an uplifted hand. All right. Darlene down there wants prayer too. Let's pray for the church. Remember the church here. Let's pray that God will give us some committed people. That's what we need in the church. Yes. And we got that. We got that right. Okay, we're going to sing. Fred's going to sing a couple verses of Silent Night, and then we'll go to prayer. Fred?
songs while our hearts are far from you. Oh Lord our God we pray. Speak to us today. Draw our hearts to Christ we pray today. May Christmas be something real, genuine, authentic. May it be a salvation. May it be Christ living in us. May it be a spirit. May it be more than that. May it be knowing God and living for God in this world. Come our Father with our sin our waywardness, our rebellion. We ask you, God, to give us a will to want your will. To give us a will to want your truth, to want your love, to want your son, to want Jesus enough that we die for him as he died for us. We pray today, Father, for those that are in great need in our church, Myrtle Barber, passing through a valley. And we know you love Myrtle very much and she's been a wonderful saint of the church. You've been in this church for years. Lord our God, we thank you for the faith that you gave her. And we thank you for the way you kept her all these 94 plus years. And we thank you, Lord, for keeping, she's kept the faith. And she's run the race. Lord our God, we don't know when you're going to take her. But we know this, that we need her here. We need somebody with some faith and some stability in the church to hold the church. 
We're asking you to bless her, our Father. We're asking you to heal her. We're asking you to make her a testimony. That you keep who you want. And you know your sheep, and nobody, nobody fools you at all. For you're the great heart knower. You look on the hearts of what people put on the outside. They might put a lot of stuff on the outside, but you look down in the heart. And you see if a man's heart's really committed. If they really sacrifice themselves to let Christ live. They don't fool anybody. And so we pray today that you'll bless Myrtle with healing. That you'll raise her up off her sickbed to be a testimony. We realize that she's going to come home to you. One day she won't be raised up. And we put her in your hands, our Father. We know that if you raise her up, you could raise her up and stand around her feet, or you could raise her up to the glories of heaven where the angels are singing and the streets are gold and where Jesus is waiting. But we just ask you that your will be done. Shirley Horner, we pray for her, Father, that you heal her and raise her up. Bless her, our Father. She's a young person, 57 years old. And Gordon James, we pray for him that healing might be his. The bell of palsy. Frank Jerky, bless him, God, whatever his need might be. And Frank's family, you know what the needs are there. Lloyd Scholl, who's so sick, our father, so close to death. We ask you, God, to intercede with this Christian man, too, to bless him. May your blessed will be done in his life. Darlene Hastings, our father, needing a healing touch on her arm and needing a blessing as she's starting to work at goodwill. It's hard to make the adjustment. We pray that you'd be with her. And all the unspoken requests are the uplifted hands. Father, you know them. You know the needs of our church, the financial need we have. We need a committed Christians, what we need. We need some committed people that would really be, we have some of them. They're wonderful people, the committed ones. But we have so many that are uncommitted. They spend the money at the first of the month and they come back about the 15th with nothing for the Lord. They rob the Lord and they spit him in his face. Father, help us not to be in that crew at all. Help us be the crew that bows at his feet and worships and loves and adores him and gives our heart and our life to the one who died for us. Just pray, Father, you bless our service today. We pray to overshadow with your mighty power. We pray that this will not be a regular service. That this will be the service of God. And that we be judged by the word of this service. And that we ever turn our backs on the truth that comes forth today. We'll face it at Calvary. We'll face it, our Father, when Jesus returns. Bless us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Christ so loved us that he died for us. It was love that drew him to the cross and kept him on the cross. And I might say that I think the, the way you give to Christ at Christmas is about the amount of the love you have for him. If you give nothing to Christ, you really don't have much love for Christ. Don't tell me you do. The way you act, it shows your love too. Whether you obey him, whether you live for him, whether you let him live in your life. But you really don't love Christ. You might want heaven to be your home. You might want to just play with Christianity and play with Christ. But you really don't love him. If you don't want to really give to the Lord. Because the Lord's one who gave his life to you. And if you don't want to give back to the one who gave his life. Then you're playing games. From the cradle at Bethlehem. Jesus gave himself to God and the old rugged cross. From the moment he started out. There was a shadow over him. He was to be savior. His name was to be Jesus. He was to save the people from their sin. He crucified himself in his commitment to life. He just, he was crucifying himself all the time. He couldn't live for the world. He crucified himself to live. That he might be fit to be crucified for the world. He had to be crucified person to be crucified for us sinners. Are you committed to life even to the point of sacrificial living and giving are you really committed to give something and live something out are you really committed enough to let christ live otherwise really your life is in vain you're living in a delusion a confused delusion is what you're in you can play with the church all you want you can come every other month once a month but you're just playing with your life and you're on a russian roulette and time is running up for you have the ushers come forward. See who's our usher. We'll take you over. Go ahead. Fred can be another. Our Father, help us be real Christians. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
thank Dale and Fred for their specials and Dave for this offertory, beautiful offertory this morning. Just a few announcements. Uh, no agape meal today at noon, but at 4 o'clock we'll have the children's Christmas program and uh, we'll have real angels, real shepherds, and a real baby boy Jesus and a real Mary and Joseph. They'll all be here, plus a lot of real children. I want you to come, I want you to invite others, and I'm sure they'll straighten it all out by 4 o'clock. Open house at 5 o'clock, and I want you to come and have a wonderful time, and uh, we'll be sharing with you. I'll be making a, my infamous salad this afternoon. Seafood salad, crab, shrimp, and clams, and uh, I think you'll enjoy it. So we're going to come ahead. We'll have sandwiches, and uh, we'll be working on this afternoon. We love you folks, and uh, we've stayed with you many years, shared life with you. God's been good to my soul. I might be quite poor, but I'm rich in the Lord today, and I'm thankful for what the Lord has done in my life and how He is in my life today. Maybe if I was a wealthy pastor someplace, I wouldn't have the experience I have in Christ today. But I'm thankful for Him. Uh, after the open house today, we'll be giving a, a bag of Christmas treats out to you, each one of you. And uh, for you adults that attended this service this morning, that Dorothy and I will be, or I'm, I will, have Dorothy on, deliver your Christmas gift tomorrow. And uh, I want you to be blessed at Christmas time. I want to bless you for your faithfulness. We should really give this Christmas gift, this gift out on a day, on a Sunday when a normal Sunday. Because those are the people that really need to be blessed. The faithful of God are the ones that will. And they're the ones that will be blessed when Jesus said, Come be my faithful, inherit my kingdom. And they will be the people that were committed and faithful will be the ones that inherit the kingdom. They will not be the unfaithful. He'll say to the unfaithful, Depart from me, I never knew you. That's what the Bible says. Well, you want to be faithful. The day is short, Christ is coming. And I'll tell you, revival is coming to Duluth. And revival will come to your heart if you're faithful. God bless you. Uh, David's going to sing this special and I'll deliver a message.
Christmas? Ever heard about the Grinch that sold Christmas? No. A lot of us steal Christmas. We may not even know we're stealing it, but we steal it. I'm reading out of, uh, not out of Luke 2, because I read there a couple times, but out of John 10, the first 10 verses of John 10, if you want to follow the Bible. Remember, I want you to think of this. I want you to think of it in the context of when Jesus is born in Bethlehem. Remember the night when it's all as bright as day? The stars over Bethlehem's manger. The shepherds are quickened by the angels. The angels are everywhere. And there's singing everywhere. There's jubilation everywhere. And Christ is born in a manger at Bethlehem. Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep, but climbs up some other way, he's a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he puts forth all his own, he goes before them. And the sheep follow him because they know his voice. And a stranger they simply will not follow, but they will flee from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus spoke to them, but they did not understand what the, those things were which he had been saying to them. And Jesus therefore said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. And who came before me are thieves and robbers. But the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. But I come that they may have life might have it abundantly. Would you bow your heads in prayer for just a moment? Our Father, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ now that you'll allow the Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts this morning. Lord, you know the need of our hearts. We pray speak to our hearts, not our ears, not our itching ears. Help us, our Father. To have ears to hear the Spirit of God, to hear the truth of God. That we might become the children of God. That we might be light in a world of darkness. We ask you, Father, to overshadow us with your power. And let your word come forth in boldness. Let it come forth the way you want it to come. To jar us loose from that which is had us in bondage. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Christmas time, it seems like the whole world is caught up with a glorious celebration. We're caught up in the season. We don't always know the reason for the season, but everybody gets caught up in the season. And there's a spirit that's caught up, even a good, gracious spirit that we're caught up in. There's all kinds of spirits we're caught up in, by the way. I think a lot of us get caught up in lawless spirits. Spirits that don't belong to the Lord Jesus Christ or God. We do it whatever we want to do when you have a lawless spirit. And the lawless spirit is the spirit of the world. And the world is not of Jesus, and the world hated Jesus when he was here. And the flesh is of the world, and it works against the spirit of God. Everyone wants to have a good time. If it feels good, do it. It's a motto of our age. Everyone wants to eat, drink, and be merry. It seems like we're almost in Noah's day. All the tinsel and the Christmas trees and the gifts, and Santa Claus, the parties, the decorations, all the dazzle of Christmas is all around us. The songs are going. The carols are even going. And still amidst all the carols, and amidst all the church services, amidst it all, we have lawless people that do not know Christmas at all. They play with God and they play with Christmas. This is even true in family gatherings and meals. Sometimes the family is more important than Jesus and more important than God. It's all done in the spirit of the world. Many times 
Most of this is done in the spirit of the world and done in the spirit of carnality. And the Bible says that the flesh is at war against the spirit and they're contrary to one another and they'll never get together. And we either give ourselves to the world in carnality or we give ourselves to the kingdom of God, the Son of God, and live in His Spirit. Now you've got one or the other today. And you're heading for heaven or hell today. If you should die this moment, the spirit you have will transport you. Even the baby Jesus being born at Bethlehem. It's all fine. Let him be born and let's get with the celebration. As long as we can have our banquets, as long as we can get something out of it, as long as we can drink our alcohol and have our immorality and do whatever we want to do, it's all right to have him born. We'll go along with the celebration as long as we can do our thing. As long as we can be caught up in our sensuality. <coughs> But people leave off. They leave off something in this whole thing. And they rob themselves of Christmas. And I tell you, they rob God of Christmas. We were all sinners. We come before Jesus. And Jesus said he was the way, the truth, and the life. And no man could come to the Father but by him. And then if we try to get up in any other way, we're robbers. And a lot of us are trying to get up in some other way than the way of Jesus Christ. We'll take religion, we'll take the church, we'll take anything that we can have in our little monastery that we can program, that we can set, we'll set Jesus in a few. Anything as long as He doesn't get our heart. We can have what, what He is, or His religion, but we don't want Him. So amidst all the dazzle and joy of Christmas, there is little meaning without a commitment to God. And I want you to get this in your mind. That unless you commit yourself to God, there is little meaning for your life. That you are just like a player that is strutting up on the stage that soon will be no more. Shakespeare. Your salvation that Jesus brings means little or nothing without a real commitment to God. Your life means little without a commitment to God. This church means little without a commitment to God. Either we get a commitment to God and be the church of God, or it means little to God. Christmas without commitment is a delusion. I want you to stick that in your mind. Christmas without commitment is a delusion. It's not really real. Salvation without a commitment is a delusion. And your life without a commitment to God is a delusion. You're living something that's phony. It'll be blown away by the Lord Jesus when He comes back. And the church without a commitment is a delusion. Well, God's Word is clear. There must be a commitment to God. The first commandment says... There, there you shall have no other gods before me, the living God says. You shall fear and love and trust in God above all things. Not above some things, but all things. And in Jesus Christ, if we give our hearts to Christ, we become new creations. And the old things all pass away and all things become new. And all things are of God. Jesus said you cannot serve two masters. You'll hate one and you'll love the other. You cannot serve God and man. Many of you have been double-minded. You've been going back and forth. God part-time and your flesh part-time. It won't work. A house divided itself will fall. You will fall. If you keep a divided mind, you're going to fall. If you let Christ, let the Holy Spirit give you the mind of Christ, you'll live. And you'll live to God. And you'll commit to God. Well, without commitment to God, we are really lost and deluded. Any way to look at it. What does it mean to have a commitment to God? That's the question. <coughs> First, it means loving, studying, and obeying His Word. You can't get past the Word of God to have a commitment to God. You must take the Word of God. You must let the Word of God speak to your soul. 
The Bible says God gives the Holy Spirit to those who obey Him. Jesus said, if you love me, you keep my commandments. And Jesus said, he who hears my commands and does them is the one who builds his house upon a rock. But the person that won't really study the Word and won't listen to the Word and won't obey the Word, he's going to fall. It's going to be like building his life upon sand and he's going to be swept away. So you've got to get a commitment to this Word of God because this Word of God has God in the Word. Over in Timothy it says it's God breathed. The Akmatos. God is in the Word. And whatever you do with the Bible, the Word of God, you're doing with God. It says the, the whole Bible is the sum of truth, so we need to read the whole Bible. We need to study the Bible. And I'll tell you, you can tell how committed you are to the Bible by what, what prayer meeting night or Bible study night. Not always that, but... Some of you can't make it in a Bible study, never. But most of the time I say that's it. Or by how you're treating your Bible at home. Are you really looking at it? Are you studying it? Are you loving it? Are you getting with discussion groups? Are, what are you doing with the Bible? What you've done with the Bible is what you've done with God. If you've got nothing in the Bible, if you don't spend any time with the Bible, if you don't care about the Bible, you really don't care about God. Don't fool yourself. Don't delude yourself any longer. A commitment to the Word must take place because Jesus Christ was committed to the Word. At 12 years old, he said, I must be about my father's business. And he argued the Bible, dialogued the Bible with the scholars of his day. So the kids back there, they need to study the Word. They need to know the Word. They need to live by the Word. They need hearts that are full of God too. Just as much as you do. I'd say they need it worse than the day we live. And it was Jesus who lived by the word of God when he was under temptation. He kept quoting the scriptures. It is written, it is written, it is written. And all his life he lived by God. And to live by God's word is to live by God's will because the will of God is in the word of God. And Jesus said, not everyone that will say, Lord, Lord, will enter in the kingdom of God. But he that doeth my Father's will that's in heaven. My friends, you'll never do God's will if you won't even look at his word. And won't love his word and study his word. <coughs> It was God's will that took him up to Calvary. It was God's word. God kept, kept saying, you have to go to Calvary. You have to die. And the third day you'll rise again. He kept telling his disciples that. But God gave him a word before it was ever written. You see, God has a holy word. And I've given you a holy word today. Mark my words. This is from God to you. Don't you ever discount it. It'll judge you someday. And so Jesus got the word of God and he went through the garden of Gethsemane. Not my will, but my will be done. You said I had to do it and I'll do it, Father. What have you been doing with God and his word? What have you been doing with God's will for your life? Have you been studying yourself to show yourself approved? If Jesus Christ come back, would he say, Enter in the joys of the Lord, your faithful servant. Well, if you if you don't give a commitment to the Word of God, you don't give a commitment to God. I, I think you're blown away right away. I think anybody that won't commit to the Word is is out of it. They can forget about it. You can forget about the rest I preach if you won't commit to the Word. You'll never get past your rebellion without the Word of God. It's your will against the will of God. Either the will of God is going to have His way, the Word of God is going to have His way, or you're going to have your way. And as long as you have your way, you're, you're not heading home to heaven. There's only one way to heaven. Jesus is the door and He's the way. There's no other way. And He has a will, the will of God, to bring to our hearts and lives. And you'll never make it without the will of God. You, you can live in your carnality all your life. You can downbeat the church. You can say how bad the church is, how bad uh, everything else is. And not live by the word. You'll find out when it's over. You'll rob yourself of Christmas. You'll never know Christ. You'll never know God. You'll never know what Christmas is all about. Because you wouldn't even give yourself to the word. And then the word that become flesh. And my friends, Jesus Christ came and bore witness to this word, this truth. He never ever went against the word of God. For he was the word of God in the flesh. Well, if you're going to give yourself to the Word of God, 
the Holy Spirit will come to you. For God gives the Spirit to those who obey him, Acts 5.32. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commands, and I'll send the Comforter. Don't expect the Comforter if you want to obey the Word. You haven't even got, you're trying to get to the second base, and you haven't got the first base yet. Secondly, commitment to God means being committed to His Spirit. You see, it's not enough. We can never get past ourselves. Even if we just get committed to the Word, we desperately need the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will come out of commitment. Commitment brings the Holy Spirit to our hearts and lives. We desperately need Him to get past who we are. The flesh, the lust, the affections of the flesh, the values we have, the mind we have, our old self, our old habits, our old stimulus, everything that's made us do all of our lives. We need the Holy Spirit to lead us past Him. He's the one that has opened us to all the truth. And He has come here to lead us into a full knowledge of truth. So we might really know all about ourselves and all about God's kingdom. We might fully come to know Jesus Christ in God. For if the Holy Spirit does not teach us who Jesus is, we'll never know God. For Jesus was the express revelation of God. He was God with us. He was Emmanuel. He wasn't just a baby in a manger and a Christmas song going on. He was somebody who grew up, died on an old rugged cross, but he was among us as God, showing us what it meant to live a godly life. The Holy Spirit comes to help us live in one accord with Jesus. We don't know how to live with Jesus, but the Spirit comes and teaches the truth that as He has taught us, we abide in Jesus. 1 John 2.27 but the Holy Spirit comes. He comes to give us gifts. He comes to give us a ministry. He comes to give us a new identity. He comes to form Jesus in our lives. He comes to help us. Finally find out who we are. We don't know who we are. And we miss Christmas if we will not commit to the Holy Spirit. We are not committing to some kind of fanatical experience or some kind of fanatical gifts. We are committing to the Almighty God that the Spirit of God would help us come to know this living God and to know Jesus Christ whom thou, whom he sent. And Jesus said this is life eternal. But if we commit to the Holy Spirit, we're committing to the church. Because the whole church is put together by the Spirit. If you believe the word, if you'll follow the word, you're washed in the blood. You'll find Jesus and he'll wash you in his blood. He'll, and if you commit yourself to Jesus Christ and his way, he's going to send the spirit to your heart. And you're going to get put in a body of Christ. That's what the church is all about. It's kind of a commit to, to the word of God and to Jesus Christ so that we can come to the Holy Spirit. And he can bind us together. And it's the Holy Spirit's work. To give us a real commitment. We need to be committed to the word before he ever comes. But I tell you after he comes. We're committed to Jesus and God like never before. Because no man can say that Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Ghost. But the Holy Ghost brings the kingdom of God. He brings peace and joy. He brings what the angels were singing about. Peace in our hearts. And he brings to us. Joy. Victory. Brings us ministry. Jesus Christ lived by God's Spirit, led by God's Spirit, led into the wilderness. He was committed to the Word of God. He was committed to the Spirit of God. He let the Spirit lead him up into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. He let the Spirit lead him through life, lead him in his ministry, lead him up a road to an old rugged cross. It was the Spirit that took him through Gethsemane, his hardest moments to face the cross. But the Spirit was always saying, do the will of God, do the will of God. Obey the word of God, do the will of God. And God kept speaking to him. The Holy Spirit speaks to our hearts and our minds about how we're living and what we need to do. Directly to us too. How are, you, are you committed to God's Spirit? Have you got that far? Has the Spirit come to your life since you obeyed Christ? Since you obeyed the word? If his spirit has never come, you need to go back to step one. You need to get yourself right with the word of God. And then you have to get right with the Son of God if you get right with the word of God. 
Because He was the Word to become flesh. If you're not living in the Spirit and allowing the Spirit to help you, you're living in your flesh and you're carnal. And to be carnally minded is death. But to live in the Spirit and to be spiritually minded is life. For the Holy Spirit is going to bring Christmas to our soul. Or he'll bring Christ to our soul. And that's the last point. Commitment to God means allowing Jesus Christ to live in our lives, in our hearts. But you can't have Jesus live in your heart. You won't obey the word of God. You won't commit to the word of God. You won't commit to the spirit of God who brings love and truth and victory to your soul. And forms Jesus there. You can never have Jesus in your life much without the spirit of God. Paul wrote to the Galatians, how do you think? You started with the Holy Spirit. And now do you think that you can perfect yourself? My little children, I travail in birth till Christ be again formed in you. Well, the word says, put on Christ and make no provision for the flesh. <coughs> Paul asked the Corinthian church, is Christ in you or are you things? <coughs> Commitment to God is to let Jesus live in our lives, let him live in our hearts, and let him do something through us. Let him be something through us. The church at Laodicea, they had a religion without Christ. They were rich. They had a rich church. That's something we don't have. At least we don't have to worry about the latest dashing thing. Although the people were lukewarm. You see, what I'm what saying here is that you let Christ out of your life and you're usually lukewarm. You might have a lot of religion, but you're all over the place. You're never in attendance. And, and some people have got so much religion, they go to about 20 churches. And they're like a round robin. You, you wonder what church you're going to be at next. But they don't let Christ live in their life. They don't know what they want. They need Christ. They desperately long for Christ. But they try to replace it with religions. <clears throat> the church of Laodicea. Jesus was outside standing. Hey fellows. I want to come back in. <laughs> he said don't you know if you're lukewarm. I'll spew you out of my mouth. But I want to come back in. And I want to live with you. And I want to sup with you. And he's really saying I want to make you the church that I, I want you to be. I tell you, the church can never be the church without Christ in her. We can never be much of anything without credit. We don't match. Even at our best religion that we've manufactured, even maybe we've obeyed the word, maybe with the Spirit has come, and maybe we've made our own religion like the Corinthians did. They said, well, we got the Spirit, and when Christ has come, we, we can make our own religion. We'll make our own church. They were far from God. They didn't know God. They didn't know that when you let Jesus be formed in you, you get reconciled with God. When you get let Jesus be formed in you by the Holy Spirit and by the Word of God, there's a crucifixion that goes on. That self has to be is crucified by allowing the Word to come and the Spirit to come and Jesus to come. That there's a crucifixion that goes on automatically. The old man can't live when the new man is being formed. He's got to die. He's, you, there's some crucifixion going on when the Word of God gets a hold of you. And you live by the Word of God. You have to die to who you are to let the Word live. And you have to die to who you are to let the Spirit live. And you have to die to who you are to let Jesus live in all His beauty in your soul. <coughs> well, how about you? What, have you? what kind of commitment do you have to God? What kind of commitment do you have to this? Word, God-filled Word, this God-filled Spirit, this God-filled Son of God, who is not in a manger but rose from the dead, ascended to heaven and now come back to our heart by the Holy Spirit and comes alive in us as we allow the Spirit to form. No, there's no crucifixion in the Christian that there's really not too much commitment. Because commitment demands crucifixion. Commitment for Jesus demanded crucifixion. And commitment to us, for us, to the Word of God, to the Spirit of God, to the Son of God demands crucifixion. And if we won't crucify, then we'll never know, really know, the full meaning of Christmas. If we won't give God the right place with His Word and commitment, then we're going to rob ourselves of Christmas. 
If we won't really let the Spirit lead us and guide us and form Jesus in it, we're going to rob ourselves. If we won't take our place in the church, you're going to rob yourself of Christmas. That's the Holy Spirit's work. If you won't let Jesus take his place in your heart, you'll rob yourself of Christmas. No, you'll become a robber. Because you see, all that come before him were robbers. And he said, if you won't go in through the door and won't go by me, you're a robber. He said, if you try to get in any other way, you're a robber. <coughs> so are you robbing yourself of Christmas? Are you caught up in a delusion? In a confusion of Christmas? And not really letting Christmas be God's God in His Word, God in His love, God in His Spirit, God in His Son. Are you really letting God be God? Or have you got your little religion that you're worshiping? <coughs> we struggle here financially. Few people give anything to God, really. There's a few. We have a few that carry this church. Most of the people in this church, they don't want to give anything. They don't want to give a dollar hardly. They don't want to tithe this. Tithe is supposed to be 10% that you give to the Lord. I really don't think they want a church. Not by the way they act. They don't love the church. Christ loved the church and died for the church. They say they love the church and they won't give a dollar. We have a $150 light bill every month. Probably have 150 gas bill every month. We have a $227 insurance that has to pay. And we have a telephone. And that leaves me without anything. And you, the folks you folks out there, some of you are so lost that you don't even pay for your lights and your heat when you come here. You expect everybody else to give to you. And you don't want to give anything to the Lord. Well, you go ahead with your lawlessness, but I'm telling you, you're robbing yourself of what Christianity is all about. You're robbing yourself of Christmas. Someday you'll find out. You'll look in the eyes of Jesus. Every knee shall bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is indeed Lord and you'll bow before Him. And He'll look in your eyes and He'll ask you, what did you do with my word? And what did you do with my life of spirit? And what did you do with my church? And what did you do with your stewardship that you had on earth? What did you do? What did you do with me? Why did you choke me? Why did you kill me? Why did you push me out of your life and leave some kind of religion be there? This might be a hard sermon, but I hope it's, it's only for the people that are doing this kind of lawlessness because it's not of God. And I'll never, ever, ever say it's of God. And I want you to know how lawless you are. Because if Christ come today, He'd judge you for your lawlessness. I'll tell you that. And He wouldn't tell you, well done, my good and faithful servant, if you're not really good and faithful. Would you bow your heads? Our Father, we just thank you today for the word. We thank you for the truth that sets us free. And we pray, Lord, that we can say ouch and amen to the truth. And that we'll correct our behavior. We'll repent because repenting means to change our mind. To do what's right instead of what's wrong. And just because we are in a habit of doing it wrong. It doesn't mean we can't do it right. And the Bible says if a man will cleanse himself of all these things. He can be a vessel that's changed from dishonor to honor. Meet for the master's use. I'm so thankful today that it's not condemnation. But it's salvation through Jesus Christ. And he's still the door. And his word is still real. And His Spirit is life, and He is our salvation in our hearts. Bless us now, our Father, as we sing this closing hymn. We pray that some will come and pray today and say, Lord, I want to be a Christian. I want to have the victory that's in Jesus, with Jesus today. Amen. I want Dave to come and sing that song, Victory in Jesus. The altar is open. I want you to come and pray if you need to pray. If you're all right, if you're committed, fully committed, you don't need to pray. But if you're not fully committed... You better come and commit.
We have to recommit all the time that we're, we're ready to be open to all the truth that the Holy Spirit brings to us. We want to be everything that God wants us to be, so we have to be committing to all He wants to show us. Oh Lord, bless these two as they commit themselves to what the Spirit has been showing them in their lives, in their hearts. We ask you to bless them. We ask you to make these commitments real, to validate them, to let them grow, Lord, to let them glow for Christ. We pray for them, that they'll commit to the Word and commit to the Spirit and commit to the Son of God, that Jesus will live, and that when the world looks upon them, they'll catch a glimpse of Jesus in their hearts and in their lives. And we just ask you to bless Darlene and bless Carlton. Bless them both, Heavenly Father. Cause them to be stronger than ever as they walk with Christ in this world. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you stand for the benediction? We ran over a little bit, but we needed to hear a little more. Father, we pray now that you will bless us as we go. Do not let your word return void, we pray. Let that word be upon us by the Holy Ghost. Oh, Spirit of God, use it in our minds. Help us that we won't play church any longer. We won't play religion any longer. That we won't be like little children playing games with God. But that we'll let Jesus, let the word have its way, the Spirit and Jesus have his way by the word and the Spirit in our lives. So that God, that we might get to know you and love you and serve you like we should. Bless our families. May this be a tremendous Christmas. We ask you to make it a real Christmas. Don't let us rob Christmas of its meaning, of its intent, of its purpose. But may we let Christmas be Christmas in the name of God and in the name of Jesus Christ. Bless us as we go now. Bless our program this afternoon. Our open house may be wonderful. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.